call the meeting to order and welcome you to this, the 17th meeting of the Public Petitions Committee in 2017. You can remind members and others in the room to switch phones and other devices to silent. We have one item of business today. That is the consideration of petition, petition 1517 on polypropylene mesh medical devices lodged by Elaine Holmes and Olive McElroy, who are in the gallery this morning. And can I welcome our non-committee MSPs, Neil Finlay, Jackson Carlow, John Scott and Alec Neil. We will hear evidence from two panels. First is Dr. Will Agar. Dr. Agar was a clinician member of the Independent Review before resigning on 1st March. After we hear from Dr. Agar, we will take evidence from the petitioners, Elaine Holmes and Olive McElroy. Members have a note by the clerk which summarises the evidence we heard in May from the Chair of the Independent Review, the Cabinet Secretary and Chief Medical Officer. The note also provides an overview of the submissions provided by the witnesses in advance of today's meeting. The submissions from the witnesses are included in the correspondence and members also have a copy of the timeline of email correspondence referred to in the petitioner's submission. The committee has also received a number of submissions from MESH survivors describing the impact that MESH has had on them and their lives. The submissions that were received before our meeting papers were issued and included with our, patients, our papers. Submissions received after this date um, are in the process of being published and will be on the petition website. And we should note, um, for the committee's interest and others, that the scale of the response has been very significant um, from across the world, I think, yeah, indicating an interest in this petition that goes way, way beyond Scotland itself. So there are a number of areas to cover this morning. I would propose, therefore, to move on to the first evidence session, and I welcome Dr. Will Agar, consultant gynaecologist and obstetrician, and formerly a member of the Independent Review. Thank you for attending this morning, Dr. Agar. You have an opportunity to provide a brief opening <coughs> statement, after which we'll move to questions. <coughs> Thank you, convener, and I'm truly grateful for the opportunity to appear before the committee to provide evidence and to answer questions from members. I would like to thank the patient campaigners, Elaine Holmes and Olive McElroy, for bringing this important subject to public awareness by petitioning Parliament to urge government for action on the six points in order to reduce harm to women considering surgery for stress urinary incontinence and pelvic organ prolapse. I was invited to participate in the independent review of transvaginal mesh procedures as a clinician member, and I would like to thank all members of the review group for all their efforts and teamwork over the last three years. I signed up to the publication of the interim report on the 3rd of October 2015, but I resigned four weeks prior to the publication of the final report on the 27th of March 2017. I believe the government's final report could have done more to reduce harm without losing value, to highlight the details of mesh-related risks while maintaining patient-centered approach, and to promote shared decision-making between patients and their clinicians with, while striking a good balance of the trade-offs to be considered. I believe more needs to be done to bring this report up to the standards and up to the principles outlined in the Chief Medical Officer's Framework document realistic medicine. I am here today to request the committee to urge government officials to open the final report to a public consultation period for six to eight weeks, for example. During this well-recognized transparency process, officials will publish the feedback received from various stakeholders, publish the responses from the review body, and amend the report if necessary. Similar procedures were adopted by the European Union prior to publication of their final report on the mesh procedures and devices, and is a well-recognized procedure prior to the publication of clinical guidelines by the Clinical Guideline Development Group of the National Institute of Clinical Health, of Health and Clinical Excellence in England. Along with the announced review of the process by Professor Britton, I believe an accompanying review of the outcome or of the content, which is the report itself, will restore full credibility and public confidence to the MESH report, and more importantly, would reduce harm to women considering surgery for incontinence and prolapse. Since this petition was lodged in May 2014, this committee has heard from patient campaigners, journalists, lawyers, health ministers, medical officers, public health consultants, two chairmen of the review, 
as well as representative from the device watchdog, the MHRA. This is the first time the committee hears from a surgeon who used these uh, div medical devices during performing the surgical procedures. A surgeon who used to be a member of the government short life working group, a member of the expert group, as well as a previous member of the independent review group. All views expressed in this statement in my submission and during answering your questions are mine and are based on my interpretation of scientific evidence, my own values and the standards upon which I practice medicine. I do hope my appearance today will be helpful to the committee to take matters forward and I am ready to take your questions. Okay, thank you very much for that. Neil? I wonder if I could raise a few issues in relation to your register of interests um, before we begin the session. Can you with your indulgence? I think this might be helpful. In the uh, uh, final submission, you um, point to a piece of work uh, for the University of Aberdeen, and you, uh, the description in it is ensuring accuracy and integrity of the SIMS pilot short and long-term study. Um, I just want to kind of tease that out a bit. What, what was the issue around accuracy and integrity? Um, so I participated in, uh, or I collaborated with the uh, SIMS study. That was the pilot study that recruited in 2010. This is different from the definitive larger SIMS study that finished recruitment last year. I, I collaborated with the uh, pilot SIMS study, uh, but I did not recruit patients for the definitive uh, 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 SIMS study. Um, in the study I, col I collaborated on in 2010, um, th the outcome uh, reported by, uh, uh, by ourselves, the, the researchers, have different parameters. So we look into some different parameters to assess the outcome and uh, uh, decide where, which mesh procedure is, is the best. Um, I felt that these parameters uh, may have uh, changed during the course of the study itself, and I wanted to be absolutely sure that the whatever patients are reporting to us is what we are reporting in the manuscript for publication as part of the scientific literature. Uh, clearly, this is a very high-profile issue with a lot of interest from uh, uh, from several stakeholders. So I just wanted to be absolutely clear that all the figures and, and all the parameters are 100% accurate before, uh, before we, we do the publications. And um, I continue to collaborate with the University of Aberdeen to make sure that the two studies, the one um, uh, that has already published four uh, papers and the, the one that we are about to publish, are 100% accurate before they go into the scientific record. So I'm currently waiting for, from, for the University of Aberdeen to provide me with a governance report. And once that happens, um, I, I plan to, to visit the university to review the data myself, because it's so important that before I put my name on, on, on the publication that, it, that I am 100% comfortable that it is accurate. Give you a, I do have questions about the register of interest in relation to the um, the review group, is it appropriate to raise that now or we later? Maybe make some progress first, yeah. we can come back to that. <coughs> when I call you, you can do it then. I wondered, um, just in um, opening up the question, if you could summarise for us what you think the difference between the interim report and the final report was, and why those differences mattered. So, if we, the, the, I, th I think from my point of view, the, the main differences are in chapter six, this is the clinician chapter, and also in the conclusions. So the differences uh, between the chapter six in the interim report and the, the, that of the final report is in the way the data were presented. The interim report, we were, we were very clear on the methodology that was adopted. So, uh, and I did describe this, myth, this, this methodology um, uh, in one of the appendices here where it's entitled Notes on Chapter Six. So, we approached this by um, uh, summarizing top evidence from international studies. So the, the study that summarized, reviewed, and meta-analyzed the data internationally in this particular topic, comparing two different mesh procedures, the two commonest mesh procedures performed in Scotland, um, and identified the important outcomes for us clinicians and for patients as well. We looked into the details of how 
the trade-offs between these two procedures uh, or the trade-offs of the advantage and disadvantage, we uh, uh, added the accurate figures from the review and put it in a format that the layperson would understand, uh, highlighted what the authors of the study would, would come to a conclusion, which procedure is better, and what do we, after interpreting the evidence itself, not just going to the conclusion of the authors, but going deep into the data, what we believe is important and what is, what is, which one is better than the other. And then we took the patient's views into consideration as well, what outcomes are important for them, and uh, we came to a conclusion at the end of the, of the chapter uh, that um, at the time was um, uh, unusual um, in expressing concerns about the procedure, the contrast procedure most commonly presented in Scotland. So we were leading, um, we were the first, so the, the, the Scottish Independent Review Group was the first authority in the world to, to formally express concerns about a procedure that many clinicians and surgeons and other authorities around the world consider it is a gold standard. So that was a big step for us, and we've achieved this because we looked into the details of evidence, not just as clinicians, but as clinicians, patients, regulators, representatives from clinical societies, and this is where evidence comes to life. Because if evidence that in just in the literature is not interpreted, then it is not living. But it comes to life when clinicians, patients, regulators, and, and other stakeholders interpret it. That was a huge success. And other institutions and organizations has followed our path. At least we did not receive any formal feedback that I am aware of <laughs> that criticizes our unique position at the time in October 2015. And that was a big step forward that we do express concerns about the procedure most commonly performed in Scotland prior to the suspension of procedures. Unfortunately, this particular expression of concern was removed from the conclusion of the uh, uh, final report. So the, that concern is not there anymore. And when I speak to my uh, uh, colleagues, clinicians and surgeons, what do they understand by the removal of, of these concerns? Um, you get different responses. So some would say, well, these they were used to be concerns, but these concerns are not there anymore. So that means this procedure perhaps is better or there are no more concerns about it, so we can go on, on and perform it. Others would understand that uh, the, these, they just removed this procedure completely from the conclusion. That means these concerns are being firmed up. So the, 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 the recommendation, in my view, was ambiguous. And from speaking to my own colleagues, it gives an ambiguous message. So that is, that is one of, of the reasons. And I believe that the, the, the concerns were removed because the format and the content of chapter six has significantly changed between the interim and the final report. So um, all the methodology I've, ex I've expressed uh, uh, prior, uh, uh, the, the methodology that we followed prior to the publication of the interim report has completely changed when the chapter was deleted in, in January this year. And it is now replaced only by clinician's opinion in only four page uh, chapter that uh, does not have references and expresses the, uh, the opinion of the majority of the clinicians currently. And unfortunately, I do believe that this chapter has very cleverly expressed all the advantages of the MESH procedures for incontinence, but did not mention the most common adverse events, which is MESH erosion and it also did not mention the most debilitating adverse event, which is chronic pain. And I do believe that these are important adverse events that should have been mentioned in the current chapter six. It, they were mentioned in the previous chapter six, both in the interim report and in the one that was deleted in January with the addition of the three ad additional tables. Um, so I, I do believe that the original chapter six has given far more information in a format that both patients and clinicians would understand and would help them to reach a shared decision making um, uh, when they are considering these MESH procedures. Thank you. Uh, Angus? <coughs> okay, thanks, um, convener. Good morning, uh, Dr. Agar. Um, following on from the convener's uh, initial question, um, you, you, you've stated that you have a number of concerns about the use of best available evidence. Um, 
Could you expand on that? Could you give us some more detail uh, with regard to your concerns? The concerns about the use of best available evidence yes. in the chapter or? In general. In general. So the, there are av several available resources. Uh, th there are several resources available to the review group. And the uh, chapter five, uh, which has been written by our uh, colleagues in the public health department, uh, has reviewed several sources of uh, uh, primary research and secondary research for summarizing the studies, as well as um, uh, government reviews and, and, and those from uh, regulators all, all over the world. Um, the, the evidence can sometimes be conflicting, and that conflict needs to be resolved. So there has been differences in, inter in, 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 the, in the conclusions of some of these reviews, and differences between international evidence, evidence generated here in Scotland, evidence coming from England, and it was our duty that we sat together and resolve all this evidence, agree on what are the most likely uh, um, uh, outcome or compar comparisons between mesh procedures and bring the patients with us on board to, 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 be, to, to be able to provide good leadership with this. Um, I believe more could have been done um, uh, in this respect and that mainly in relation to safety. Um, with regards to efficacy or with regards to the ability of these mesh and non-mesh procedures to control the condition of stress urinary incontinence, there is no significant difference between the two. And the mesh procedures never promised to control stress incontinence better than the non-mesh procedures. All they promised is recovery-related advantages. So shorter theater time, shorter anesthetics, quicker return, shorter hospital stay, and quicker return to normal activities, which are important outcomes for many, many women, but may not be as important when the lifetime uh, uh, mesh-related risks are considered at the time. So I do believe that there has been some evidence that could have been scrutinized better. There has been some uh, differences in outcomes of evidence that we could have brought together to resolve that conflict. Thank you. Um, Neil? Of advantages there, um, cheaper also, a cheaper procedure? Yes, it is. There had, there's evidence that, the, um, uh, that adopting mesh tape procedures for incontinence saves the NHS a uh, significant uh, uh, amount of money. That is true. Is there a a ratio, you know, is it five times, twice, one, you know, whatever? Well, so um, the, the original difference has showed that between 100 and 200, I can't remember the figure exactly, but between 100 and 200 pounds per, per procedure. Uh, Brian? Thank you, Kavina. Good morning, Dr. Agar. Um, in evidence to the committee, the chair of the review said that the evidence presented in the Nature Journal was not considered by the review because it did not meet the Cochrane review criteria. And I wonder if you would care to comment on that? Okay, so the Cochrane Review criteria uh, looks at only randomized evidence. So randomized controlled trials are the, the, the best trial that, um, uh, that can be conducted, and that, is be, that would be the best evidence. Now, the randomized controlled trials um, do not, the vast majority of randomized controlled trials do not follow the patients long enough. And the, the design, the randomized control trials themselves, that their design is not the best to identify exactly the differences in safety or in adverse events, particularly if these adverse events can happen years and years later, long after the researchers have stopped following up the patients. So the best design study is, is to look at a ret retrospectively on analysis of large databases. So the nature study that you've, you've referred to has looked into over 300 studies that describe the mesh-related <laughs> adverse event. I do believe that this is currently the best evidence summary of the mesh-related adverse events. And it's, been, it's commissioned by a leading journal with Nature. And um, the study was conducted over uh, at least two or three years, and uh, I do believe that this currently summarizes the best evidence in the mesh-related adverse events. Um, it did say that 
the risk of having a negative uh, outcome is 15%, so that is one in seven. But that negative outcome also includes failure of the procedure to control incontinence. I wished we had more time to discuss this study in detail. So this study has been, was, was circulated to the group twice. Once by uh, the secretary last year, and uh, again directly by, by myself, but it, did not, uh, it, did, it was not included in the agenda. And I do believe if it was included in the agenda, we would have described the mesh-related adverse <coughs> event a little bit better. We would have been more informed. If I, if I may, um, the, the Cabinet Secretary has advised the committee that the review to be undertaken by Professor Britton will consider the process of the independent review but will not re-examine the evidence. Again, I, I would appreciate your comments. That is so important and I very much welcome that move because I do believe that there are issues with the process and obviously the Health uh, uh, Minister also was um, uh, fe felt that the, a review of the process is necessary, so that is, that is really good. I do believe that there is a very important that we do have a parallel review of the content or the outcome of this process. So if we are concerned about the process, then we are concerned about the outcome as well. And if there are stakes are high and there are, um, uh, there are lives at, at, at risk of being ruined, <laughs> then I think a review of the content is, is quite important. And I do believe that the, uh, obviously we cannot roll this back. So there is no, th this process will not change. And the review by Professor Britton, I don't think it will change the process that has already happened, but there will be lessons to learn for other other independent reviews performed by government. Um, and there will, there will be lessons to learn and, and to look back and to reflect as, 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 as ourselves as ex-members of the group. Um, but I do believe that the best way to look at the content, the outcome of this review, would be by a, opening the report to a public consultation process. This is a well-recognized process um, on uh, issuing clinical guidelines and issuing uh, independent reviews. Thank you. I wanted to ask whether you have a view on whether actually this review was independent and is that part of the problem in terms of people having confidence in it? So I, 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 mean, I did hear the criticism that the, the previous um, um, chair was more independent than, than the current chair. I mean, as a clinician member of the group, I don't look much at the independence. I have a task in front of me to, to go and find the evidence and discuss this with my colleagues, present it in a way that lay members of the group, particularly the patients, would understand, and bring everyone together um, around the conclusion, even though it is not in line with, if, with, with, with other views of other organizations. And we managed to do that very successfully before the publication of the interim report. But unfortunately, that did not happen in, in the, in the, in the uh, uh, prior to the final report. And I've heard the criticism that an independent review is only independent if the chair is independent. And um, I mean, I'm a clinician, I'm not, I'm not a politician really, so I've, I will leave this to politicians to decide. Good luck with that one. Um, John Scott. Thank you. Uh, thank you, convener, and good morning, Dr. Aguirre, and thank you for making me so welcome. Um, can I just recap, and, and for the record, and perhaps I missed it, but can you tell me and put it on the record why you think Chapter 6 was withdrawn and what the implications of that is uh, in, in medical terms and, and, and for, for patients as well, please? So I do not know why Chapter 6 was, was deleted. Because no means that you ask a question, why was it deleted, and then you, you, you receive an answer, it was deleted because one, two, three. I did ask the question, why are we deleting the chapter? But I did not receive a response that is formal and that is convincing. Um, the, so the chapter, I did, I did put in the, one of the appendices a timeline of how the chapter was drafted back in May in response to the publication of a very important Cochrane review in uh, March. And um, I, uh, we, we followed the same methodology um, uh, that we started with in, uh, in summer 2015 with the, the interim report. And it was so important for me that we maintain consistency, even if the conclusions, even if the figures are uh, different to what we believe, or even if the figure challenges our own belief. 
So uh, prior to drafting this chapter, prior to summarizing the, 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 um, the review that was published in, in March, there were, there were no disagreement whatsoever. And we, in fact, the meeting in March 2016 was expected to be the final meeting. But the publication of a new review uh, prompted us to, re to go back, look at the figures, and uh, address the review in exactly the same way we did in 2015. And consistency was quite important for me. So I did draft the summary again of that review, exactly as I did in, in summer uh, 2015. Um, but there, was the, they were um, uh, surprising for me because they did challenge my own belief. I did believe that the vertical tape or the retropubic tape is the gold standard, and it is safer than the non-mesh alternative, cold suspension and autologous link. Um, but I, the figures challenged what I, what I believed. Um, so uh, I felt like I'm, I'm, I'm stumbling on the truth, and uh, you know, I, could, I could just stand up, brush it off, and carry on as if nothing happens, and there would not be any problems at all, or I could sit down, reflect on it, is it really true, and present it and ask my colleagues what they think. And I've chosen to do the, 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 the second path, which is sit down, reflect, summarize it exactly in a consistent way as I've done in summer 2015, and present it to my colleague and uh, to the rest of the group. And this is exactly what I've done. <coughs> Your timeline makes a number of references to the calls to delete table one, which is obviously the concerns. Just, can you clarify for me, was this made by clinicians? Who, who, who was making those calls? So we, we sat together and we looked at all those, the, 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 uh, the evidence, the, the summary of the evidence, exactly in the same way with the, uh, we, we did with the interim report. And there were calls to delete the tables. And um, uh, there has been several reasons uh, given um, as in uh, the figures are not accurate. So we went back to look at the figures and we ensured that they are accurate. Uh, that claim was made again that these figures are not accurate. So we went to the original author of the, of the independent review who is in, uh, in Southeast Asia some, some, somewhere. And she responded very quickly and we, I put an acknowledgement to her, to her work in the deleted chapter actually. Um, and uh, we verified beyond doubt whatsoever that these figures are, are, are accurate. So it was the clinician members of the group that decided at the end by majority to remove the tables. I'm, I'm struggling to understand why. I mean, why, why would, they, would they do that if the figures were accurate? So the figures were accurate. Um, perhaps, well, I, I say I do not know because I did ask the question and I said, um, and, uh, and, and I'm sure Professor Britton will, have, will, will, will look into the, how the process of um, uh, completely changing the format of, of chapter six has come about. Um, and um, uh, well, because I don't know, then I have to tell you, I don't know. Uh, but the, 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 the reasons were given at the time that these figures were not accurate. We ensured that these figures are accurate. Uh, reasons were given other, uh, uh, further later on where all the evidence should be in Chapter 5, not in Chapter 6. But my view was that we need to maintain consistency if we publish something in the interim report and it has worked very well and the patients have signed up to it, there is no need to change the, uh, the format, and uh, I put it to, to, the, to the whole group that um, doing a U-turn on our methodology and risking consistency um, is not healthy for the group. Thank you. Can I just ask one more question? Are you surprised that um, more than 400 people have appeared to have been given mesh implants since the moratorium in 2014? Does that surprise you? Well, yes and no. Um, uh, well, th th there is a government suspension in place. There um, was a request to health board to suspend all procedures. Um, some health board decided to follow the suspension. Other health board decided not to follow the suspension. And uh, I must say, I did advise my board um, to partially suspend. So I advised my board to suspend the mesh procedures for prolapse because I already suspended this in my practice. So, um, and also advise my board to suspend the mesh procedures for incontinence, the, vertic the horizontal tape, but I wanted to continue doing the vertical tape because at the time, in 2014, I was convinced that that is the best treatment. 
Um, however, um, um, uh, the, the, the managers in, in, in my health board decided to follow the government suspension in full, and in retrospect, they were right, and I was wrong, and I did tell them that. So the health boards had complete autonomy in whether to actually follow this, these guidelines or Absolutely. not? Absolutely. So when the request from health minister goes into the boards, goes to the chief executive and the medical director, the medical director will ask the group of clinicians and surgeons who perform these procedures about their views, um, saying, look, this go the letter coming from government asking us to consider the suspension. Are we going to suspend or are we not going to suspend? Uh, or are we going to partially suspend? So there has been variation in practice from different health boards. That is true. Thank you. Neil? Thank you. Can, can I begin just by going back to the report? Can I ask you, um, given the evidence taken and researched by the independent review group, and looking at that evidence today, does that evidence support the conclusions of the final report? Or do the conclusions basically ignore some or all of the evidence? So we could, we could all look at the same thing and see it differently. Yeah? So we could all have a look at the, at the same figure where you're sitting on your side, you see it as nine. I'm sitting here, I see it at six. It is so important that we publish that figure as it is and let people decide what it is. So that is why I was so keen that we publish the table as they are in consistency with the, what we did in the interim report. Um, looking at the conclusions just now, I did not feel that I would be fulfilling my duty as a doctor in reducing harm to patients if I follow these recommendations. I thought they could reduce harm without losing value. And I do believe that, you see, no, no member of the independent review would want to risk patients. No <laughs> member of the independent review would want to, 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 to cause harm or to reduce safety or, or anything like that. But I think there has been worry about value. And I think from my own interpretation of evidence, I thought we can significantly reduce harm still without you losing that value. So looking at the conclusions now, I don't, I don't, I don't think they are, uh, uh, they, they are, I'm talking about conclusion seven and eight, by the way, because you have conclusion one to six, these are about the safeguards, information, research, mandatory reporting to watchdog, etc. Well, I'm talking about seven and eight, because these are the ones that relate to the, to the procedures. Seven relates to stress incontinence, and eight relate to pelvic organ prolapse. So if I can put the question another way, um, recommendations seven and eight, do they, in your view, maximize patient safety in relation to these procedures, or is there still a big question mark around the patient safety of these recommend implications of these recommendations? I believe these, con I believe these conclusions could have done more to, to ensure safety of women considering these procedures. So it doesn't maximize patient safety? It could have done more. Right. I thought you weren't a politician. <laughs> <laughs> can, I, can I ask, okay, I think that's uh, reasonably clear. Uh, can, I, can I just ask, um, is it your opinion that members of the independent review, other members were noble to make the changes? Ask me the question again, please. Where other do you think there were any external influences impacting on the difference between the interim report and the final report? Were members of the independent review group, do you, in your opinion, possibly nobbled to change the, uh, make the changes that happened between the interim and the final report? No, I am not aware of any external influences that has affected the, the, the conclusions of the report. So was there any additional academic, scientific, medical research undertaken or concluded between the, you're aware of between the, med, between the interim report and the final report that would have impacted on the, and would have informed the difference between the interim and the final report? Yes, there have been publications that uh, were uh, uh, came into the scientific literature between the publication of the interim report and the final report. We summarized this in the deleted chapter, yes. 
but they are, they are not in the body of the report now. Well, that's a substantial point. In other words, yes. the, the, the additional evidence that uh, was avail became available after the interim report would have reinforced the, inf the interim report rather than led to changes. That's correct. Right, okay. Can I just ask a final question? Because clearly a key demand of the campaigners who've done a fantastic job on this issue is that there should be a ban on the use of mesh implants. Do you support that demand? So this, this is a, a very important question. And um, That's why I'm asking it. yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes. So mesh procedures are not created equal, and this has been a learning process for uh, for myself and for for many other of my colleagues as well. Uh, prior to the suspension of mesh procedures in June 2014, I had already stopped performing transvaginal uh, mesh for prolapse. I stopped these procedures already uh, several months before the suspension in my own practice. And a few months before the suspension, I already stopped performing the transobturator tape. At that time, I did not have any of my patients coming with complications with it. Uh, life is too short to learn from my own mistakes. I must learn from others as well. And after I stopped, I've started to see my own patients coming back with complications. So in retrospect, it was the right thing to stop. When the mesh was suspended in Scotland, I was still convinced that the retropubic tape which is the original procedure that came out in the, in the late 90s, uh, is the best procedure, is the gold standard, and is much better than the non-mesh procedures. <laughs> Having reviewed the evidence, that belief is not there anymore. And is the vertical tape. That's right, yes. So that view is not there anymore. So if you ask me, do I believe that the use of mesh procedure for prolapse should be banned? Yes, I do. If you ask me, if, do you believe that the, tran the transverse, the, um, the transobturator tape or the horizontal tape should be banned? Yes, I do, except, <laughs> in very rare situations. So, it's like if, if, if a young child has a brain tumor and we're thinking of, of doing a laser. We are damned if we do and if we're damned if we don't. And this is not a single surgeon's uh, uh, decision, it has to be, uh, a decision by a group of surgeons uh, nationally. And this is what I suggested to the chair in my uh, comments on, on, the, uh, on the conclusions. If you ask me whether the vertical tape should be banned, I would say it should be restricted to situations where the patient has already considered the non-mesh procedures and um, where, where the patient either do not want to have the non-mesh procedures or the, uh, uh, at, at least two or three surgeons have decided that the non-mesh procedures would carry significant risk that outweigh the risk of the mesh procedures, if, if, if you know what I mean. Okay. Um, uh, I, I, think, I think it's also important to say that the, the, I've noticed it, it is not only about the, um, uh, the incidence of adverse events, uh, as I said before, it's not about efficacy at all. Both procedures control incontinence in a, in a similar way. It's all about safety. So the trade-off that patients will need to do um, uh, or, or will, need, will need to consider when they are choosing these procedures is um, uh, would a patient accept the risk of chronic pain, taking painkillers for the rest of her life, uh, l losing the, the, the ability for intimate relationship with the partner for the rest of her life just because she wants to stay in hospital one night or two nights less or just because she wants to go back to work uh, three or four weeks earlier. Uh, that, that, I think that is a very imp important trade-off. So increasingly, I found out in my own practice that when women are giving unbiased information, balanced information on both mesh and non-mesh procedures, they go for the non-mesh procedures. That could be the influence of the media though, yeah? Or maybe I am, I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm worried about litigation as well. Maybe I direct my, I used to direct my patients to have the mesh surgery, but I now direct them to having non-mesh surgery. So in my unit, we drafted a shared decision form, and that one is in the last appendix in my submission. Um, we started using this form just over a year now, completely taking out the influence of the surgeon, of the healthcare uh, 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 professional, and asking patients just to, re to read the leaflets and to document on the shared decision form what do they want. 
women who heard about the mesh problems in the media and women who did not hear about the mesh problems in the media, the vast majority of them, has chosen the non-mesh option. And I do believe that is because of the acceptability. Even if the risk is just so small, even if the risk is less than 1%, but the stakes are quite high. Thanks very much. Can I take Brian briefly, then Michelle, and then I'll take Neil. Thank you. Uh, just, just for my own information, if I can go back to the, the clinician's response to uh, the moratorium, I think, certainly myself, and I know some of my colleagues were quite surprised that health boards have autonomy in accepting or declining uh, a, a moratorium. And I wonder, is, is there any feedback from health boards back to uh, the Cabinet Secretary in terms of whether there's an acceptance or declining of a moratorium? Do you know, I wonder if that's a question you could answer. Uh, well, I have not seen this feedback, but um, my understanding is that there has been correspondence from the Cabinet Secretary asking individual health boards to suspend these mesh procedures or to consider the suspension of these mesh procedures. Health boards have considered, some have agreed to suspend, others did not agree to suspend. So I presume that there has been some sort of feedback to the Cabinet Secretary of what is the uh, uh, situation on the ground, yes. But I'm not sure if that happened. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Just... Uh, Michelle? Okay, thank you, Dr. Okay. In the evidence on the 18th of May, um, the committee were told that all the information that was in Chapter 6 in the interim report is still available, um, but some concern was expressed about access to that. Can you just tell us what your, your view is around that? That is correct. Mm -hmm. That is correct. So all the evidence has been published. But the, um, the important table that made a huge difference in expressing concerns and has put Scotland in the lead in, in, in restricting the use of the, of the, of the uh, uh, horizontal tape has been moved to an appendix at the end of the main report. And the new tables that were generated last summer that um, inform the crucial decision whether a patient should have a mesh procedure or, or, or a non-mesh procedure have been um, moved into an annex online completely outside the report, among the minutes and the agendas. Can I just ask as well, I want to slightly revisit my colleague um, Rona Mackay's question to you, um, because listening to what you've been saying, you started by saying when you, when you gave your opening speech that there was a very collegiate approach during the development of the interim report, that the clinicians discussed it, they came together, and the report was pretty much constructed without too much conflict. And then when you came to do the final report, suddenly that seems to have fallen apart. And yet you've just said in, in the last five minutes that actually the evidence that came out since the publishing of the interim report actually strengthened some of the arguments from what you put in the interim report, and yet it was changed. Rona asked specifically, where did the calls come from to remove chapter six? Um, and I was unclear from your answer. Was it the clinicians themselves, individually, that started saying, actually, I think we should change this and remove this? Or did the call come from outside the clinician group? The, there are no calls from outside the clinician group. Right, so it was all internal. So, so can you just revisit that and clarify for us, what, what was it that changed within the clinician group that took you from being collegiate and, and designing that interim report in agreement to suddenly wanting to change it when the new evidence seemed to suggest you know, strengthening it rather than removing it. I'm quite confused about that. So I've, I've explained that when, when the, and I also put that in a group email to the group before. So when, when we are faced with facts reported by top level evidence that contradicts our own belief it's natural and it's human that we respond differently. Um, some would, would be able to get the belief out, challenge it, examine it, spring clean it, and put it back in, or replace it with something different according to the, the truth that uh, was in this particular study. And it's not just this particular study. It is quite important that if this study contradicts our own views, or if this study contradicts other study, that we study them together and resolve any issues. And then we can reach consensus on the content. And I, it was so important for me. And the content is far more important than the format, isn't it? So the message is so more important than the package. So as long as we agree on the content, we can present it in the form of paragraphs. We can present it in the form of tables. 
there was, was a view to move all evidence into chapter five. Now, chapter five is written by a public uh, uh, health specialist. And uh, it is very meticulous, it is very comprehensive, and I really admire the way that was presented and the amount of effort that went into it. It is just, it's probably the most comprehensive review of all the evidence in, into that MESH procedures. But it is difficult for patients to understand. It's difficult even for me to understand some of the things in, in, in chapter five. So that was the whole point of presenting chapter six in a table format. Some members believe that a table format is not a good idea. Other members believe that, well, let's move all the evidence back into chapter five. I wanted to get the best evidence out of chapter five, put it in a table format that is understandable by patients, exactly as we did in the interim report, and we had the patients on board with that methodology prior to the interim report. That did, sorry. Was there a fear by clinicians that if it was made terribly accessible in effect for, for patients and for lay people to read that the work they had done up to date would be very challengeable. Um, well, I, th I, I do believe, I mean, you, so I'm, I'm expressing my views here and uh, my view is probably not shared by the majority. So I think it's so important that this committee would hear from a clinician who strongly supports the, the, uh, the way the evidence is presented, strongly supports the way the conclusions were presented. And uh, I think that the committee will benefit a lot from the presence of, of, uh, of, um, of a clinician uh, that d does not agree 100% with my views. Thank you. Yeah, uh, reading the number of the submissions from uh, the women, uh, I, I, I didn't know this morning whether to cry or whether to smash the computer up because I was so frustrated by reading those uh, submissions. And you have said it's not about efficacy. So can you describe then, if we have two systems of dealing with these problems and it's not about efficacy, can you talk about the complications of both? Talking about the adverse events of both, yes. the mesh non -mesh procedure and, mesh. and the number. Okay, so um, let's talk about. Um, I mean, there are several non mesh procedures and several mesh procedures, but we will talk about the standard in each. So we're going to talk about the standard mesh procedure, which is a vertical tape, and we're going to talk about the standard non mesh procedure, which is called colpo suspension, or some patients like to call it hitch and stitch. So. The, the advantages of the uh, mesh tape procedure, as I mentioned briefly, are all related to recovery. So it's a minimally invasive procedure. It is easily performed. It, it is easily trained. Relatively shorter learning curve. Um, saves money to the NHS. Shorter theater time. Shorter hospital stay. And quicker recovery and quicker return to normal activities. The disadvantage of, of, the, of the mesh tape are immediate and delayed. The immediate ones is a significantly higher risk of bladder damage during the operation. Now, we clinicians believe, or the vast majority of us believe, that the intraoperative or the, the damage to the bladder during the operation by the, the, by the trocar of the mesh tape does not have any long-term uh, consequences. Basically, the trocar, or the needle comes back out and goes back in the right place. We do not need to close the bladder. It heals uh, uh, nicely and there would be no problems. Um, uh, the, the reason why there is significantly more bladder damage with the mesh tape, because it's a blind procedure. I can see where the needle is going <laughs> and I can see where it's coming out, but I don't see what happens in the 15 centimeters it's, it's inside the body. It can go into the bladder. That's why the manufacturer suggests that we put a camera in the bladder to make sure that uh, it did not go in the bladder. And if it did, then we take it out and place it back again. Um, uh, on, the, on the other hand, the non-mesh procedures does not have this uh, or have a, a, less, a less risk of bladder damage because I can see where the needle is going all the time. It is under vision. And also the non-mesh procedure respects the patient tissues. So I tailor the procedure to the patient. I know exactly where the needle should go for this particular patient and where it needs these to come out. And there's usually no need to put any cameras because everything is under vision. Um, but it is a, 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 it's a very fine technical uh, uh, surgical 
procedure. Uh, so if we now talk about the late advantages or the, or the, or the so late uh, adverse events, um, the most troubling late adverse event of the mesh tape procedure is chronic pain. And uh, um, uh, pain during intimate relationship with the partner. The risks are small, but when it happens, it happens significantly and it really impacts quality of life. The problem with that, that, that is usually due to damage to the muscles or due to <laughs> damage to the nerves. And damage to the nerve also affects mobility. Now, that seems to be less than 1%, but when it happens, it is absolutely devastating. So when a patient comes to me and she needs to, have a, she needs to make a decision between a, a mesh procedure or a non-mesh procedure, it is not only the, the, the percentage, it's also, it's also about what is the severity of the adverse events, what's the impact on quality of life, what is the best case scenario, what's the worst case scenario, what is the most common case scenario. Can I predict this problem? Can I prevent it? If it happens, can I reverse it? And the answer to this, if we are talking about nerve pain, is no. Because the, 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 the procedure described by manufacturer does not respect the variations in individual patients. Let me say that again. The procedure described by the manufacturer does not respect the variation between, the, the, uh, between individual patients. So it's two centimeters below that point, it's two centimeters later to that point, this is where you introduce the needle, and all of a sudden it's just come down the other end. So, and that is the same procedure regardless of body weight, regardless of the anatomy, and regardless of this. And it really frustrates me that after, long after I stopped performing some of these procedures, I found publications in the literature by members of the manufacturer themselves saying that we've done studies and we found out that actually the mesh is much closer to the nerve than we, than we used to think. That really frustrates me because I expected the manufacturer to communicate that to me. That, publication, for example, was published in 2011. So, um, right, and, and, and I think that is the difference between uh, drug companies and device manufacturers. So a headache tablet that works for only four hours and disappears from the body goes under massively rigorous procedures before they come on the market, before I can prescribe it. But a medical device, it's not a lot of rigorous procedures, come out quickly. And that is a system issue. And I alluded to this in one of the appendices about the, 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 Swiss, cheese, the Swiss cheese model. In relation to, um, I would imagine that there, uh, there isn't a huge group of people who can perform these procedures. I'm, I, I would imagine it's a relatively small amount in Scotland. But they seem to be very powerful. So, for example, you have said you had the conversation with the health board about whether there would be a suspension or not. And I'm sure the health board rely pretty heavily on their local group of surgeons who can uh, produce that um, evidence or verification. <clears throat> in the procedure, uh, sorry, in the uh, review group, and in general, the issue of declaration of interest, I think, is, is pretty critical. So my understanding is that the review group asked people for one year's declaration of interest in relation to whether they had been involved in trials or anything alongside some of the companies involved. And that some people in the review group produced a much longer list going back several years of how their involvement, but the government insisted it was only one year. Were some of the people who were involved in the review compromised? Are some of the people who advise health boards, some of the surgeons, are they compromised by their connections to some of the companies and some of the organisations who are promoting these products? If, if, if there are interests that are not declared, then I don't know about it. Um, if you're asking about my opinion, then I know I do not believe that um, uh, any member has, has failed to declare their, their, uh, their, their interest. Because it only went back a year. Um, I, I agree with you. The, the, the form could become better. And perhaps this is something that Professor Britton would look at, because I, I believe that the, the, pro, the review of the process by, by Professor Britton will, will look at conflict of interest and how to, to ask members of the independent review yeah, about the conflict. That, I, forgive me, but I, I'm not sure whether that will um, ask the questions that say, Mr. So-and-so, Mrs. So-and-so, you were on this committee, you were on this review group, sorry, and um, you declared your one-year declaration of interest 
But if you had gone back for, further, would it have been more transparent to the whole process for us to see whether you had a conflict? Now, I don't know if a review of the process will identify whether there were conflicts there or whether it will just be a generalist approach that says this should happen in the future. But if it had um, gone back further and asked people to declare, do you think that would have been a much more transparent process? I believe so. The more declared, the better. Uh, uh, well, I, I, can, I, can I just mention that it's not only about competing interests with manufacturers. It's, it's also about um, other interests, as in vested interests, as um, uh, if members have heavily invested in a certain position and have advised their health boards on a certain position, then that, you know, change that, that could also... So it's not only financial... Credibility. I, I, I think. I think. I think. Yeah, that does not come on or the form. Or you may call it arrogance. Oh, it's not on the form. It's. It's not. It's not on the form. Yeah. So. Um, I, I, well, I, I do believe. I mean, I. I, I believe I was <coughs> lucky. I was lucky because they. My. My own health board just suspended everything against my advice at the time, which were they were right, and I did tell them that. Um, but that brought me to the to the to the independent review on equal footing. I did not. I, I invested with using the mesh procedures. I received funding from mesh manufacturers, and I also invested in non-mesh procedures. Um, so I just came to the interview to, to the independent review uh, um, with my all my competing in, interest as reconciled as possible. And I believe if my health board would would have taken a different position, then I perhaps could perhaps could be a bit more biased, but that does not come on the conflict of interest form. It is not asked by the conflict of interest form, and I did not declare it, and uh, I don't think anyone who, did, I, didn't, I, didn't, I don't think those who did not declare it have done something wrong. That's something in our consideration of our committee, is that what we might want to ask the independent review of the review to look at, and actually in terms of giving confidence to the independence of, of the review itself, that may be something we can pursue. Can I take Jackson, Carlo, and then Michelle's indicator once again? Uh, good morning, uh, Dr. Ugger. And I'll just ask two quick questions because you've given evidence extensively. And can I pay tribute as well to the professional way you've done this? You haven't yeah, yeah. done anything sensationally in the way in which you chose to resign from the review group. I have before me, the um, in relation to conclusions seven and eight, which have been referred to uh, several times, um, the interim report wording, the final report wording, and the suggestions that you sent in February 2017, which did not find support and then led to your resignation from the committee. And I suppose I do want to ask again the question Alec Neil put to you. In its final wording in the report, which is the one publicly available today and on which people are making decisions, do you think the wording in conclusions seven and eight is safe? It will be much safer if we take the word routinely out of conclusion eight. Um, I believe the full stop should come after offered. So it should not be offered full stop until there is evidence in the future that could show there is benefit from prolapse mesh procedures. So I, I believe conclusion eight could be safer if we take the word routinely out. And that was the whole subject of the first page of my submission. And in relation to conclusion seven, you, you make quite specific um, alterations there too in relation to the balance that I think you think is now left in the wording. Yes. The concerns expressed about the horizontal tape, the most commonly performed procedure in Scotland, these concerns expressed in the interim report in 2015 were removed from conclusion seven. I expect these concerns either to remain or to be firmed up saying we've now concluded that the transobturator tape, the horizontal tape, has risks that outweigh the benefit and it's either should not be performed at all or should be performed in very highly exceptional circumstances with agreement of a national team. And the second question in relation you drew a distinction between clinicians and those operating and the manufacturers of the devices. The manufacturers of the devices are regulated by the MHRA, who have a responsibility in this regard. As a consequence of your experience throughout this process, do you feel that the MHRA, in the way that it has performed in relation to uh, mesh devices, has proved itself to be fit for purpose? The MHRA has issued a blanket 
judgment that benefits outweigh the risk. I do not agree with this, and I, I believe that there are a large majority of, of clinicians who believe that at least one procedure or one device, the risks outweigh the benefit. I would, I would have been happier and far more comfortable if my device watchdog suspends these procedures or bans these devices, not the manufacturer. The initiative has always come from the manufacturer, and it has always been communicated to us as, um, as um, a commercially non-viable. Finally, on the MHRA, I understand that the MHRA is a reserved responsibility, not a devolved one. But notwithstanding that, do you believe as a result of the process that you've seen in relation to MESH that there is an argument for an examination of how the MHRA does review these devices? And do you think there has been sufficient public transparency about what that review or regulatory responsibility upon the MHRA has been and how it has been exercised? So to answer your question, the first question, yes, I do believe that the MHRA could have done a lot more. The other point about the transparency, um, the MHRA has proposed years ago to publish a transparent database of the reported adverse events of, for, for all medical devices, really. And that would bring it in line with the Australian. The TGA, the Therapeutic Goods Administration in, the, the, in Australia, the, the equivalent of the MHRA down, uh, down under, uh, appears to have done a lot more work in, in publication of the adverse events. Because as a clinician, when I see a patient coming to my clinic with, a, with an adverse event of a medical device, I want to find out, is that me? Is that the device, or is that the procedure itself? Is it the surgical package? Did I have a bad day? What's going on? So I would like to go on the website of the, of the, of the device watchdog, put in the search box the name of the device, and find out what's going on. Someone else in Basingstoke stock had a similar problem? Is it in Surrey? That sort of stuff. Is it a bad lot? I want to find out. Now, you can do that in, the, in Australia, but you cannot do that in, in, in the UK. And I think the MHRA is looking into doing things, but it looks like things are not as fast as we wanted them to be. Okay. So not transparent enough as matters stand. It can be a lot more transparent. Thank you. Thank you. I had a brief point and then I'll take John. Um, just a final one from me. The numbers in terms of women who are reporting problems and, and we see in a lot of reports about not being believed and we talk about the chronic pain but is it your view then that there are a lot of women out there who've had the procedure that may have low level pain and may not be A, associating this and B, not reporting it? And if they were, would we be seeing larger numbers? And is that, is, is that what's bringing you to your conclusion that actually it should be banned? So what bringing me to, con to the conclusion that some devices have risks that outweigh the benefit is by balancing the risks outweigh the benefit what's published in, already in the literature from the, from the uh, uh, evidence for, uh, from the retrospective 20-year review in Scotland <coughs> and from my own experience as well as that of my own colleagues. Um, if you're talking about chronic uh, pain, there is some evidence that the, the, the average time period between the, having the, the transvaginal mesh device and the development of this problem is about four to five years. So we had uh, a peak of performing this procedure in Scotland in about 2010, or maybe 2011. So we've reached the top already. These procedures have significantly dropped even before the suspension. So the peak of these, the adverse events has been already reached in 2014, 2015. The patients I'm seeing now uh, I rarely now see patients coming forward for the first time presenting with mesh-related adverse events. What I see now in my own unit are those patients who've been in the system and they're coming for a second review. And this is something that I would expect because we have already hit the top and we are on the down slope for both the procedures and the adverse events. And there is a four-year gap. Thank you. John Scott. Thank you, convener. I'm uh, just interested in an analysis of these outcomes and, and the fact that I think I heard you correctly when you said that this is a 15 centimetre blind procedure. Now, 15 centimetres is half of a, an old ruler in, my, in old money, uh, six inches, and, and it's a blind procedure for that 
So it must be an enormously skilled procedure. Is there an analysis of different um, health boards where these problems have been found? Is there a different analysis or is there an analysis of individual hospitals or even individual surgeons? Because it must be, if it's a, that <laughs> distance of, of, of blind procedure, um, very subject to different outcomes depending on the skills of the surgeon. Yes, that, that is true. So if uh, so, the the, uh, the fifteen centimeters in, in could be in a in a person with a different build, but this distance could be five centimeters, uh, could be ten centimeters. So um, any, anything between five and, and twenty uh, uh, centimeters. Um, yes, and, and it is a a blind procedure. There there has been no analysis at board level to say which board does this procedure better. There has been no analysis at surgeon's level and to say which surgeon is better. But there has been um, a national analysis to find out whether high volume surgeons are having a good outcome or a worse outcome um, with these procedures. And the outcome of this was there, the, the vast majority of mesh procedures done uh, in Scotland were, were done by high volume surgeons. So I personally have little, I mean, surgical skill is important and training and learning curve is important. And maintaining competency by performing certain number of procedures every year is important if, if the surgeons want to carry on with this. But the learning curve will only reduce the adverse events that are related to the surgeon, which is sometimes erosion, which is sometimes the bladder perforation. I do not believe that this will have long-term impact. So that, in other words, if a surgeon has done, if the adverse events is because of the surgeon, usually the patient is treated, moves on, and goes forward, and we don't get letters from her solicitors. But regardless of the surgeon's skill, there will be patients, regardless of whatever we do, there will be patients who will sustain injury. That The risk is low, it's less than 1%, but it can be close to a nerve, can cause nerve damage, and that can have serious consequences. No one can tell you the figures on that because we did no studies have looked into the impact of quality of life uh, uh, of nerve damage uh, following these procedures. So I, I, I do believe that training surgeons is quite important, and I do believe uh, that that will reduce the risk, but the risk that we are reducing are the ones that do not have long-term impact. Uh, uh, to reduce the risk or to eliminate the risk of nerve damage and the long-term impact is to stop these procedures completely. And because there will be women may require these procedures in the future by agreement of, of surgeons, then that person has to consider very carefully, is the problem severe enough? Is the risk too high? Can it be reversed? All these discussion, this conversation must be had in full details. All the informations that are required for this conversation were present in the deleted chapter six. Thank you. I'm just gonna take one final question from Angus MacDonald and then we'll just finish there. Okay, thanks, um, convener. I'm, I'm uh, con conscious of time. If, if I could move us on uh, to the issue of the shared decision tool, um, which you've included within the appendices in your uh, submission and it's been helpful to, to have sight of that. Um, can you explain wh what you see as the benefits of the uh, shared decision tool? Uh, and can you give us an indication of how much time you might expect uh, to spend discussing and talking through the form with a patient? This shared decision tool has been an eye opener on lots of things really. Um, uh, can, can I just mention that that was not my idea. That was an idea expressed within the expert group by the chairman uh, last year, uh, discussing the concept of a uh, request for treatment um, to perhaps be offered alongside consent. So instead of I go to the patient and I say to her, look, I have these two procedures and uh, this one I believe is better than the other and I'm taking her consent, the patient's actually reading all the information and coming to me and saying I am requesting that treatment. So, and I believe that the shared decision form has been absolutely crucial in teaching me back what did the patient understands from the leaflet. Because some patients will read the leaflet and they don't understand anything at all. Well, I believe they do understand, but they don't. Health literacy is, uh, can, can be a lot better. And uh, um, uh, I've, I've gained a lot of insight on 
individual patients' values, what's important to them and what matters to them, simply by reading what they write on this form. I encourage them to, 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 to take the boxes and, and, tell, and, and tell us what's important to them. And uh, I, then, then they, they, they choose the procedure they want, and they write why. And they, next to the other three procedures they don't want, they also write down why. And it's not only myself who interpreted this form. I take this form to our team meeting that we meet every month with the physiotherapist who have already seen the patient because they've supervised the pelvic floor exercises, with the continence nurse who has already seen the patient because she did her bladder test before, before the procedure, and we also have a clinical librarian to uh, find us the answer to important research questions about individual patients. So um, this form has been absolutely brilliant. We've been using this since uh, September, and we've been uh, significantly rel relying on it. In one of the recent um, uh, team meetings, one of the patients did not complete her form, so the team decided not to discuss her because we don't know what she wants which was absolutely brilliant. So that is really patient choice. And that is very much in line with the uh, CMO's documents, the realistic medicine. Okay, so that's a prime example of, of good practice coming, coming out of, of, of all of this. Um, one final point, uh, convener. Um, in your submission, you, you request that the final report be subject to a public consultation process, and you suggest that this could be included in uh, Professor Britton's review of the process. Uh, could you perhaps um, expand on that? Um, so uh, that is the main reason I'm here today, is to uh, open the report to a public consultation process. So the stakeholders will register their, their interest in uh, giving feedback on, on the report and uh, putting their own uh, uh, views in it. And then the government officials would publish the feedback and publish the responses and why are we not? changing the conclusions, or why are we changing the conclusions in a very transparent process, exactly as the European MISH report has done it. That's the main reason why I'm here today. This is not part of Professor Britton's uh, remit. <coughs> Professor Britton's remit is the process. My request is regarding the content or the outcome of, of the process. If we suspect something not quite with the process, then there may be something not quite with the outcome. Okay, that's obviously okay. something. An opportunity for the committee to reflect on further. I'm going to take Neil very, very briefly. For those who have used your forum, how many would choose to use MESH? 22 patients have completed the form in the last year. Only one chosen MESH, and the team realised that she did not actually read the leaflet well. <laughs> okay. Um, can I uh, thank you very much, Dr. Agar, for your time? and for the thoughtful way in which you responded to the questions. I think we got a great deal from that and really appreciated the, um, the way in which you've tackled this really, really serious issue in such a measured way. I'm going to know the people in the gallery for whom it matters a great deal. Um, that you, I think we found your evidence very, very thought-provoking indeed. So can I thank you again? We will suspend briefly before we take the next panel of witnesses.
I wonder if I can call the meeting back to order. I would like to um, restart the meeting. Can I just say that because of um, parliamentary procedures, we need to stop by 20 to 12 at the very latest. I would be intending to stop by half past 11 and that allow us a little bit of flexibility. But can I say to our uh, witnesses that if you don't get to say everything that you want to say, please feel free to contact the committee thereafter th through the clerks and they will make sure that any further points they wanted to make um, are, are provided to us and indeed we may, we may come back to you with further questions. However, we've got something just short of an hour so we should be able to, um, to pursue the, the, the questions as intended. So um, can I welcome to the table the petitioners, Elaine Holmes and Olive McElroy. The petitioners were uh, patient representatives of, on the independent review before resigning on 4th March. Can I thank you both very much for attending this morning and I would invite you to provide a brief opening statement before we move to questions. Thank you. Good morning, convener, committee, MSPs. Thank you for inviting us to speak today. We'd like to thank our Scottish Mesh survivors, families and friends who are all sitting behind us in the gallery as we spare a thought for the Mesh injured women too ill to be here. We appreciate all submissions received in support of our petition from Scotland, England, Northern Ireland, Wales, Australia and New Zealand. As you can now see, MESH truly is a growing global scandal. Sincere thanks to Dr. Wael Agur for giving comprehensive and compelling evidence regarding the whitewash final report. Unfortunately, Dr. Agur's experiences mirrored our own in several respects. The adversity and pressure we endured for almost three years as patient representatives in the review group came flooding back as we heard his words. We agree with almost everything Dr. Agur says. This is an accurate account of how he and we were marginalised, how vital evidence was ignored, deleted or hidden. After the independent chair resigned, and much to our regret, the review group lost its focus and transparency. In fact, it completely lost its way. <coughs> when former Health Secretary Alex Neil asked us to participate in the MESH review, we did so despite our own health issues. We did so because we firmly believed we had a role to play in ensuring changes were brought in so that hundreds of women in future would be protected and saved from the life-changing injuries hundreds of thousands of women around the world have needlessly suffered. We knew that nothing we did would change the course of our own lives or that of the women already un injured by these devices, but we felt we could not stand by and do nothing. Mr Neil took one look at us in our wheelchairs, struggling to stand without walking aids. He listened and he decided we were all the evidence that was necessary. He recognised that something was terribly wrong with MESH. We believed him and trusted in him when he promised that patients would be at the very heart of the review, that we would be listened to. But through no fault of Alex Neil, those promises were not fulfilled. Our voices were not heard. In fact, once he was no longer Health Secretary, things changed dramatically. We are here today to state clearly that justice was not done. Our voices were drowned out, stifled by the pro-MESH lobby, which did their best to silence and marginalise Olive and I. Despite that, we carried on, determined as we were to bring change to ensure women were given fully informed consent something few of us were given, something that the Chief Medical Officer has already admitted to the committee. When the original chair resigned from the view, things took an even more pernicious turn. Apart from not including us in meetings for a period of 10 months, the proposed final report exposed women to unnecessary risks. It bore no resemblance to the interim report, which had achieved group consensus. We went to the Cabinet Secretary for help. What we asked that she delay publication of the report, at least until our concerns were investigated, it was to no avail. She accepted the final report and its conclusions, ignoring our concerns and publishing the final report just 11 days after our meeting. 
any hope we had for change was completely dashed. The final report is certainly not in our name. It is nothing more than a whitewash. We repeatedly asked all our evidence be removed as we did not want associated with it. Our requests were ignored and denied. It is apparent to us there was never any intention of removing our input. We were cynically used to make the report appear less biased to the public and to those of you here today. We were duped, used. We are not politicians, doctors or statisticians. We are ordinary women, but we are horrified by failure rates of an operation and the severity of injuries that can be life-changing and life-threatening. The benefits of MESH simply cannot outweigh the risks. Mr Neil and the MSPs who have all voiced their concerns over this issue are correct. We are all the evidence you need to know that surgeons cannot continue putting MESH devices into women when safer alternatives are available. We fully back Mr Neil's call for an international summit to uncover the truth about plastic polypropylene mesh and we hope Scotland continues to lead the way and take a central role in this. We ask you today to use the power you have to ensure that the mesh suspension remains firmly in place. You have the power to make changes that are needed to protect patients once and for all and to change the system so that nothing like this ever happens again to other patients. Across the world, we can see the medical watchdogs have been useless, toothless, and far too close to the manufacturers <laughs> who make billions from the very medicines and medical devices they are supposed to police. We need new health watchdogs who will insist on proof to show that devices and medicines are safe as well as effective. You have the empower to ensure we have proper registers and mandatory recording of data as well as mandatory reporting of adverse incidents so patients are not put at risk. Please don't let what happened to all of us happen to others. Please do the right thing. Thank you for hearing our voice. Thank you. I don't know if you want to add anything, Olive, <coughs> at this point. No. Just Thank you very much for that. everything. It was basically a joint statement from us both. Oh. Um, and I think Dr. Aguirre, thank you to him for, you know, his integrity, his honesty, and the, you know, the evidence that he's given. I mean, basically, mesh is off the menu. Mesh is, should be stopped right now. Thank you very much for that. Can we just move then to questions? Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Mina. Uh, good morning to the petitioners, and thank you uh, very much for coming along to give evidence. Uh, can I ask, in your submission, you state that you consider the final report downplays the significance of the reclassification of surgical mesh to the highest risk, uh, class three. I think you're referring here to the information set out on page 12 of the final report. I wonder if you could clarify uh, to the committee what your main concern is here. That was just a, a discrepancy about when the actual um, EU regulations came into force. There was a, a miscommunication. The, the health minister and the CMO seemed to think it was the 5th of February 2017. But there's actually a fact sheet came out from the EU all about this EU reclassification to class three. And it said on there that min all ministers in the EU had been notified and had agreed to the content of the, the new package of device regulations and getting uh, upgraded to class three. So they all knew about it in, I think it was October 2016. Um, and it was adopted by the EU Council on the 7th of March. I think it was just a legislative, you know, date that was the 5th of uh, February 2017. So it was more than anticipated that, you know, that um, the reclassification was going to go ahead. It had been passed. It wasn't an anticipation which was put in the final report. It should have been in the final report that it was going to happen. It was happening. It wasn't anticipated. Um, just to add to that, to say, you know, in the report from a European perspective, the current position is that reclassifying these medical devices would not confer any material difference. That is just nonsense. Why would the EU consider making these devices into the highest risk category if there was no material difference? I think that, that might be 
those questions okay. answered. Um, Michelle Bounty. You referred to over 400 women having received mesh implants in the time since the moratorium was announced by Alex Neal, in comparison to fewer than 100 women having received treatments using non-mesh alternatives. Could I just clarify for the committee's understanding that these numbers are only about the number of women who have received surgical interventions, but would be much lower than the total number of women who have sought assistance due to SUI or POP? Well, we, we don't know how many other women have received um, help. This is just the official figures we were asked for. It was just the surgical procedures, and they gave us the mesh data, which was 400 women, or just over 400 women, and um, the non-mesh procedures were 100. But there may be many more that have sought help, but we don't have those figures. Yeah. So, so that's really the point, isn't it? They're not yeah. absolute. Yeah, they're yeah. not absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Rona Mackay. Good morning, Elaine. And Good morning. Um, before I ask my sort of main question, can I just go back to something you said, Elaine, in your opening statement? Um, who are the pro-mesh lobby, in your opinion? <laughs> um, if you'd sat round the table with us at the meeting, you would know who the pro-mesh lobby yeah, were. Okay. Um, let's say Olive and I weren't. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Dr Agur. Uh -huh. So, so are, are, are these clinicians, manufacturers... You know, the, the whole medical yeah. establishment, would you say? Yeah. We were, we were marginalised. Definitely. Right, OK. Yep. You could tell by the minutes. If you, if you read a lot of the minutes, you'll find, you'll see in the minutes, um, the, the, the group was not unanimous in mm -hmm. this dis decision or this discussion. Well, the not unanimous was usually Elena and myself and, objecting. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. You know, we had to really <coughs> fight every single meeting. We had to fight to get... Even the word safety or the word mesh, we had to fight to get the word mesh put in front of the word tapes because they kept saying tapes weren't mesh. We had to fight to get the word safety, safety. put in the, t uh, the heading of the review. We were told safety wasn't the remit. Okay, that's, that's pretty, sh pretty So that was starting that's, off. That's yes. pretty shocking to hear. Uh -huh. Yeah. yeah. Can, can I move on to um, informed consent? Um, You'll have heard um, the previ previous evidence about the fact that there's a lot of outdated information lying about in doctor's surgeries and uh, the information given to women was, was, was not available or out of date. Um, your submission suggests there's still outdated information on a number of uh, government and NHS websites and you refer to the leaflet being developed by the Scottish Government Expert Group as being adopted and published uh, in the rest of the UK but not Scotland. Um, can you explain a bit more about that? It's just not on the Scottish Government website. It's the um, initial leaflet that was developed in 2014 for um, mesh tapes for stress urinary incontinence. And that's the leaflet still displayed on the Scottish Government website mm. up until yesterday, I believe. This morning. This okay. morning. This morning. Um, so, still so from our last session where this was yeah, discussed, yeah. nothing's happened. So yeah. if women are looking for up-to-date information, if they go on to the BSUG website, British Society of Urogynecology, um, or uh, the English NHS, they'll find the leaflet that was actually developed in Scotland by the Scottish Government's expert group. It's available there, so anyone consenting to mesh tape procedures can go there for up-to-date information, but they won't receive that in Scotland. If it is, Maybe it's an, an appendix or something. I don't know. We can't find you it. Try to find it. Here. It's absolutely nigh impossible. I've, I, I, one of the girls actually I contacted her. She's going to go into NH, NHS and form. See if you can find this leaflet. And she was back on the phone to me saying, "Geez, oh, how how am I supposed to find this?" Eventually, you know, I, I had been going round the houses and I, I explained to her how to find it, and we found it on the NHS England website. And if you go directly to NHS. England website, you'll find it within two clicks. On the NHS Inform, you've got to go through, um, that's not even for transvaginal um, mesh um, information, you've got to go through the prolapse process and you come to an NHS Choices logo, you click on that and it takes you, and you just run about the houses before you find it. So and that sounds difficult. like something that could be easily put right, but yeah, it hasn't absolutely. been. And the, the, I think the government has been notified on several occasions, okay. highlighting the, the, the fact that they've got the, the version one on their website. They've still not changed it. Okay, thank you. 
That was quite an issue at the last evidence session when the Chief Medical Officer made a rather um, throwaway remark about uh, out-of-date magazines, but it is a concern that still hasn't been updated. Um, can I take Alec Neil now? Convener, just on that point, I think we should write... I'm not a member of the committee, it's up to the committee, <laughs> but I think you should email the Health Secretary today to point that out to her, because that's very important, mm -hmm. that that's easily accessible. And, uh, you know, patient safety is supposed to be and is the number one priority for the National Health Service in Scotland. The very least is that the websites should properly reflect that, and I think we should demand that that be sorted this week, not any time later. Uh, can I just probe, first of all, in terms of the review itself, uh, can I ask two questions, maybe three <laughs> questions? Number one, have you had an opportunity to meet with the professor who's reviewing the process, uh, or is there a date fixed up for that? Have she, has she not been in touch? No. She hasn't been in touch? No. no right. Secondly, um, the period of 10 months when you said that you had been kept in the dark and so on, was, was the, re the rest of the review, meet, the review group actually meeting during that period and, and were you not invited to the meetings? There were certainly subgroup meetings and even if it was subgroup meetings that perhaps weren't pertinent to us, there was never any minutes published or, you know, updates as to what had happened. I mean, right. we were involved in a subgroup meeting ourselves several years ago, but afterwards the minutes were published and shared with the wider patient group. We had no, no updates for 10 months. Right, OK. Uh, I, think, I think that's a major area for investigation, um, <laughs> and I hope the professor will look in detail at that, because that seems absurd to me. And, and looking back, it seems to me one of the lessons for the future is the percentage of people in a review group representing patients has to be substantially higher in future uh, so that the so-called experts don't have a, an inbuilt majority, as it were, and, a, and more independent, genuinely independent people, I think. Exactly, process. absolutely. So there's a whole, I think, we could spend all day in all of these issues because it seems to me this has not been administered genuinely as an independent review group, uh, which was the whole intention. Um, the third, the third question I have is, it's become clear this week that allegedly the MHRA has been involved in this cover-up uh, about um, pregnant women not being told about the consequences of potentially their, child, their, their unborn babies uh, developing epilepsy because of a particular uh, medication that was presented to them. This is the third major scandal in the last two or three years that I can think of, including this one where the MHRA's role has been less than professional or helpful. And I know one of my concerns is that part of the funding does come from manufacturers of devices. I don't see how you can be an independent regulator if you're even partially funded by the people who are being regulated. Um, so I, 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 I presume you share my concerns about the MHRA. And I, I know the MHRA has already given evidence to the committee but I do think that is a major problem in the, the whole system, that um, the independence of the MHRA has been part of the problem. And certainly, I have to say, when I was Health Secretary, in my dealings with them on this issue, I was, to say the least, less than satisfied. <laughs> I, I don't think they're a very professional organisation. I don't think they're a very caring organisation. I don't think they care at all about Scotland. And I, I don't think they've got... Um, patient care as their number one priority was my impression. Now, I might be being unfair there, but in terms of your um, communication and contact with the MHRA, how have you found the MHRA? Um, I find the MHRA totally frustrating, yeah. as well as being a waste of space. Yes. I don't know what purpose they serve, apart from saying the benefits outweigh the risks. Yeah. When regulators around the world you know, have issued alerts, safety alerts, um, have issued um, advice, they just continue to say the benefits outweigh the risks. Um, the girls have made posters whereby they're portrayed as burying their head in the sand, and nothing could be you know, closer to the truth. We don't even rate the MHRA. And I don't know how they can make the benefit risk kind of ratio when they've already acknowledged about the severity of the adverse incidents that, that go unreported. So they don't have the, the information to make that analysis and, and make that statement. Yep. And with, as Dr Agur has kindly and his evidence um, 
um, in the last session. He's basically backed that up, you know. Health and Sports Committee is sitting next to me, but I do think, uh, convener, that this is an issue in its own right. It needs to be flagged up to the government. The failings of the MHRA are in potentially endangering lives, not just in this, but in a whole range of other things as well. And I do think it's an issue we do need to address sooner rather than later. OK. Um, can we move on then to Jackson, please? Thank you. Good morning. Uh, can I convene, I just say that uh, Elaine Holmes was my local hero at the opening of Parliament. I suppose I should say that in tribute to the work that she has done in relation to all of this. Um, I suppose my first question to you, and you, you, you maybe can answer it, but actually Alec Neil would have been, I can't ask him the question, but were you surprised, no, at, the MH, were you surprised <laughs> that the MHRA were on the review group in the first place? Yes. 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 Uh, and given that they were the manufacturer of the device into which the review group was undertaking uh, an investigation, what was there not in your mind a sense that whatever they said was obviously going to be compromised by the position they'd already taken? Yeah. And were they, to, in your experience, one of the principal cheerleaders for the, uh, the mesh lobby as you describe it? Um, I don't know if they were the principal cheerleaders or not. Um, we did actually try very, very hard to bring more balance to the group by um, requesting that surgeons who were not pro-mesh um, be invited to participate. Every surgeon we suggested they would find a problem with them or they couldn't contact them or they didn't respond to emails or you know, it was just ridiculous um, to participate in a group where the surgeons are all pro-mesh. You heard Dr. Agur saying he was partially for some devices when uh, he joined the group, although this, um, his opinion later changed. The others didn't. They never changed their opinion. And you know from reading who participated on the group which hospitals they work in, which hospitals have flouted the mesh suspension. Ask then, I think, which I think is in, interesting and, and intriguing, given the way in which you describe the balance of the group. And we haven't had the opportunity to speak to other members of the group, so they've not had the opportunity to, to respond to that comment. But there was unanimity around the interim report. That was achieved. And then the final report obviously was a, clearly a disappointment. So it looks in the interim report as if people were at least willing to come together and be a bit more open in their thinking. Absolutely. I mean, we didn't agree with the interim report 100%. We obviously, you know, published our thoughts and concerns in a minority opinion, but there was general consensus, and we really did believe we were heading in the right direction. We were waiting in studies to publish, such as Prospect, that was the largest study of prolapse mesh in the whole world, Scottish lead, <coughs> lead study, which in fact worked in our favour because it backed up everything we said. There was no benefit to polypropylene mesh and prolapse. So if anything, the studies in that that we were waiting on should have strengthened the, the conclusions and the recommendations in the final report. But when we saw the draft final report, <coughs> we couldn't believe what we were reading. It, you know, when it told of the benefits of um, mesh, but not the risks, and then the benefits of the risks of the non-mesh alternative, but it, it, am I saying this right? The, the risks of the non-mesh alternative, but not the benefits. You know, it was just um, directing patients towards mesh. Okay. Have you? Yeah. yeah. Um, was it? You, you actually used the word duped. You, you felt that, um, in a sense, that uh, both of you had ended up being window dressing within the uh, review group in order to be able to say, oh, here are a couple of uh, sufferers uh, who, um, you know, who, as evidence that... The, the, at what point was it with the uh, dropping of the interim report or was there a growing perception in your part? At what point did you come to believe that the, um, the frustration was growing in your own mind as to what the, the actual credibility and weight was being given to your contribution and evidence and views uh, on that review group? 
Thank you for meeting us. Are you going to go? I think we, we got the draft final report through in an email and we both were so shocked. Pa practically, I think your comment was you were nearly physically sick at what we, what we saw. And, and, and that was, we realised then what was, what was going on. And then when we asked, I don't know how many times we asked for all our input to be removed from that report because it wasn't in our name. And yet they still went ahead and... and, and so you continue to trust the process yeah. effectively until you until, finally until got that report? Until we saw that draft report, it was like day and night. Right. Totally changed. And I think the most important thing was the trans obturator mesh tapes were given cause for concern in the interim report. Totally brushed under the carpet on the, the final report and just putting more patients at un unnecessary risk by That's removing it. that. Prior to receiving the draft final report, um, we hadn't been invited to participate in meetings for 10 months. We then received an email, you know, telling us that um, there was no new evidence, so we'd, we'd be receiving a draft of the final report soon. No new evidence. So we sent a list of the new studies and said, you know, this is new evidence, it's important new evidence. And we got an email back saying, Oh, yes, I knew about that. And we said, well, why wasn't it shared with the group? We haven't received any communication. We asked about um, the, the inclusion of the tables, what happened to the tables. Oh, we're, we're doing it this way now. And it just was totally confusing for patients. There was no dialogue. It seems that for 10 months, I don't know what meetings went on or what discussions were, went on, but we weren't party to them. But it seems they almost had the report ready to go and I think they were hoping we would just quietly sign our name to it. And those emails you received were from the new chair? No, they were from the Scottish Government. From they were from, am I allowed to say names? Yes, yeah. Yeah, Dr Sarah Davis. Right, OK. Um, then just two quick questions. One, you have subsequently given evidence to the investigation taking place under the uh, auspices of the Parliament in Australia. Uh, and have you formed an impression that Scotland, which was very much at the forefront of uh, the eyes of the international community, um, has been compromised by the process and that other countries are now taking a more direct and dramatic interest in these matters? And, and how do we remedy that? And I suppose the other quick question does come back to the issue. It, it was me that asked Dr Calderwood, who unfortunately drew a, an equivalence between out-of-date copies of OK Magazine and uh, at, at leaflets and information leaflets. Do you have a network of supporters within your group who are keeping you informed about the availability of literature in GP surgeries? Um, and has the assurance in relation to that aspect, not the uh, website information, has the assurance we received, uh, this committee received when it last took evidence, that th there was going to be a further clear out and updating to ensure that nothing other than current information was now unavailable in GP surgeries? To your knowledge from your group, has that taken place? So the Australian yes. issue and the, uh, the local issue. Yes, I feel Australia are... Um, forging ahead, they're more organised, and I would say the changes happened after we lost Alex Neil as Health Minister and after we lost the independent um, chair of the review group, things started to go haywire. Okay. And the next part of your question, sorry. Information in GP surgeries. Information in GP surgeries. My understanding is there is, sorry, No out-of-date information in GP surgeries that I'm aware of. Um, and there's no, actually no mesh information in any hospitals. I'm told that it's printed on... Uh, and I need to print basis. You know, if someone requests mesh, they'll then print, they'll print the leaflet because I think it's about, I don't know, about 20 pages or something like that. So there's no information... Um, and it will just be printed if and when necessary. So that is positive, um, but the negative is that on the websites, the out-of-date information is still showing. OK, thank you. Thanks. I'll take Michelle briefly and then Neil Finlay. <coughs> uh, all right, can be my questions be answered? Okay. Jackson, Neil? ask it. Um, 
You said your views have been ignored. Evidence was skewed, excluded for, from meetings for 10 months, no minutes from the subgroup, um, completely changed between the interim report and the final report and chapters removed. Um, if that's not whitewash, I don't know what is. And 97 members of this parliament signed a statement saying no whitewash. Um, this is the clearest evidence that there's an oil tanker full of whitewash in this report. And uh, I don't know what this committee is going to decide, but one thing, we have to do something because this is completely unacceptable. Um, I think Scotland was watching, uh, the world was watching Scotland and we have flunked it big style. I think this is becoming embarrassing, absolutely embarrassing. So I don't know what the committee's decisions will be. I think there are a number of things we could suggest. Could I ask, though, um, on the issue of uh, your experience of the people who were sitting around the table and your knowledge of the conflicts of interest that may have been there? Do you have knowledge of that, or is that something that other people need to look into? I think we'd get ourselves into a whole lot of bother if we said anything. Um, you'll see that um, conflicts have been declared. Um, does it concern us that you know there are witnesses for the Central Legal Office, um, that's the NHS lawyers, within the independent group? Yes, it does. But this is all declared on their conflict of interest, so at least they declared it. Um, and I'm not going to say anything else. Even the fact that the, the current chair, the new chair, was, was an acting member, an acting employee of the, NHS, you know, so... Did the changes and the change in tone and practice on the review group change when the chair changed? Yep. That's wouldn't right. listen. Wouldn't listen at all. We had a teleconference call because we actually laterally gave up actually physically attending the meetings um, because the pressure on us was enormous. You know, we'd come out, sometimes we'd be in tears. Be honest, we just couldn't hack the stress. Um, one meeting lasted for five hours. It was actually two meetings rolled into one kind of thing, and it was five hours. Um, one meeting, I'd had enough and embarrassed myself and had to leave. Um, yeah, and, and there was there was an independent. I, um, I hate saying that word. There was a review meeting, and I think it was the twenty third of January this year, and we laid out again all our concerns about the. You know that the final report in its present form is not in our name. We asked for our concern to be documented in the mi minutes of that meeting. Never was. It would just get poo pooed. It was as if we were never, we were never actually at some meetings. Some meetings. That's that's how bad it got. I mean, there's twenty. I, 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 I printed off a list of how many was actually on the review board. How many was members? And there's, I think it came to twenty six. So. It was two against 24. They'd all be sitting where you are, and you all know, of and I would be here. They would always sit far, as far away from us as possible for some reason, I don't know why. <laughs> and in, incontinence isn't caption either. No. Been to a few meetings like that as well. myself <laughs> <laughs> into bother. Um, Angus MacDonald. Okay, um, thanks, Convener. Before I ask um, my question, can I just... Uh, concur with uh, comments that have already been made about H, uh, MHRA. Um, we had representatives from the MHRA uh, giving evidence to this committee on the 24th of February uh, 2015, uh, and I think it's fair to say that their performance at this committee was poor, to say the least. Um, and I'm sure I speak for the whole of the previous committee uh, at the time, uh, that we were all left extremely frustrated uh, by their stance and the evidence that, that they gave. Um, we've already covered, um, Elaine and Olive uh, have already covered the, the issue of uh, uh, the dropping of salient points from, from the report, but I'm, I'm just curious, uh, having heard Dr. Agur uh, a, wee, a wee while ago um, specifically mention his frustration with regard to the uh, dropping of Chapter 6. I was just wondering if you've got anything else to add uh, specifically with regard to Chapter 6. The only thing I would say uh, is it started off, I mean, in, in the, the review, there was patience with a, a good outcome 
represented. There was patients like ourselves with not so good outcome. Um, it should have been the same for the clinicians. I mean, th there was four clinicians on that review, but one clinician was basically bullied to resign, as far as I could see. His, his opinions, uh, even if, if they didn't agree with him, should have been in the report, so then people could have made up their own minds. Even and if that, it was a minority opinion? He, he was just, you know, they just dismissed it out of hand, completely changed the report. I mean, transobturator mesh tapes, the most one used in Scotland, and that's the tape that was another issue, can't be removed in its entirety. And, and there was a meeting, we actually, one of the clinicians through, you know, eventually admitted going round about the houses again, yes, it can't be removed in its entirety. And that was in the interim review, given cause for concern. Then it went on to the final report, and it was now in the final report, you'll read that it can, any, ex, but any surgeon can remove any mesh, you know, any time if they've got the experience. So that's a big change from, you know, giving cause for concern to, oh, we can remove it any time, don't worry about it. Okay. That's the extremes of it. They said uh, they, they may be able to remove it at any time. May be able and to. that's just not true. That's well, not they, true. they could remove it, but then again, so could my local butcher. Uh, what's the, the consequence? Safety is the point. Yeah. What's the consequence? Okay. Yeah. Um, Moving on to the, the review of the review, um, you've already said that um, you haven't heard from Professor Britton, um, and I presume you, you, you hope to contribute to, to the review. Are there any particular aspects of the, the process that you would like to see considered? The review of the review is a waste of money and time, and they should, maybe the health minister should consider, she did consider um, previously contacting every single patient in Scotland who's had one of these mesh procedures. You know, find out what the health status is and, and go from go from there rather than review a review that's not going to have any effect on the outcome of the final report. So I, I would I would presumably um, you would agree that it, it can make sure that this doesn't happen again. Yeah well yeah. Th that's that's true as as well, you know, the, but I think I think it could be Unless no. it considers the content of the report, it's, it doesn't. It, it won't help it won't, us. It won't help us at all. We understand it will help future patients, but it won't help us. Um, have you had any indication that Professor Britton is going to contact you? No. Okay. Right. Thanks. But I think that's only a couple of months. We've got quite a few to go yet. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Can I just ask um, briefly about this issue about? Um, the inclusion of your input within the final report, because I understand how contentious that must be for you. Um, and you provide a timeline within your submission, which has been published, and the committee also had sight of the email exchanges, um, which were not, I think, with the Cabinet Secretary, but with the, the new chair. Um, can I ask if there was a point within that timeline when you felt assured that your input would not be included? I mean, at any point, do you think your concerns about your input being in the report were taken seriously? When we met with the Cabinet Secretary, she was noting it down and we said, no, we want everything removed, all our input. She said, you've already said that. I've, I've got a note of this. I'll pass it on. I'm, you know, in the meeting with Dr Gillis. So we actually felt quite assured that the Cabinet, cabinet Secretary, you know, that Dr, uh, Dr Gillis would listen to the Cabinet Secretary about our concerns. We'd already put the concerns to her ourselves. Um, and we were actually quite shocked with all the excuses and the blame and, well, you've got the timeline. And when Dr Gillis said, well, yeah, she could take the, um, the request, but we wouldn't necessarily have to accede to them, who do you think finally took the decision that your input would remain in the report? Well, I'm not sure because that was getting thrown about the houses as well. It was like either... The, the chair said she'd went back to the review group, or she said that it was the health minister, it wasn't me, it was like... And then we were too late we were to too get late it. And and it's, it's just, just, I mean, the last, I think the last meeting, the evidence was absolutely shocking. I was astonished at the evidence at the last uh, petitions meeting here when, when the chief... ...issue which we would hope that Professor Britton would be looking at yeah. is the role of 
um, patient representatives and your responsibility to your broader group, which must also be quite a, a pressure on you, yeah, yeah. Um, that you're not somehow brought into a group to give, I think the phrase was used earlier, is cover. So there must be some kind of procedure. Can I just also check with you, though, you talked about there being a 10-month period when you weren't involved at all. You're not very sure if people were having continued meetings, there might be subgroups. And then at the end of the process, you were brought back in again to look at the final report. How many meetings would there have been at that point that you actually either attended or were involved in? It's just that one in January, I think. We, we had been, well, three years of meetings. Mm -hmm. um, I don't actually recall in front of me how many meetings it is. Um, I'm just wanting to get a sense of where the gap came. Did the gap come when the new chair came in? Or was it before that? And then was it a, an attempt at least to bring you into the very final conclusion? No, well, the there was a gap because it was a summer recess yeah. and then the new chair resigned and then we got um, told that the, from the interim report there hadn't really been any new evidence and that's when we begged to differ. And then it was admitted there was evidence and, you know, we took it on from there. Um, how did things change? Yeah, I think it definitely changed when the new chair came into being. Um, we did try to have discussion with her, put across our points of view, but they weren't taken on board. And when we met with the cabinet secretary and the chief medical officer, um, we did actually feel that our views would be conveyed to the Dr Gillis but who had the final say regarding our input remaining? I don't know. Was it Dr Gillis? Was it the Cabinet Secretary? Was it the CMO? We don't know. All as we know is they went against our express wish. I'm tempted to ask a former Cabinet Secretary whether he would have that expectation that he would be able to direct the, the group in that way. I mean, the Cabinet Secretary, I, the CMO in situations like this and the, the Chair, I would have expected to uh, take guidance uh, from the Cabinet Secretary, obviously. But unfortunately, as we heard with the suspension in the health service, it doesn't always happen that way. Because when I issued the suspension, I expected, and I made it absolutely clear to every Chief Executive and Chair, I expected the wishes to be... Um, carried out by every health board, not just some of the mm -hmm. health boards. Um, you can issue a formal directive, um, but nine times out of ten that's not necessary, but clearly there were forces at work here, mm -hmm. uh, which became apparent later on, that uh, allowed some health boards to ignore effectively the suspension. Yeah, and I, I suppose I, it's just the challenge for a cabinet secretary creates an independent yeah. body cannot be seen to direct it as well so that's something that perhaps the independent review I, th I think there's also an issue with. of delivery I mean one of the things um, I think is needed um, in government uh, is a central delivery unit to make sure that the instructions of ministers are actually carried out and particularly in the health portfolio uh, in the audit committee of which I'm a member and some of the evidence we've had recently on various things has become very clear to me that under successive health secretaries, under successive governments, some of them get these instructions going way back to um, the lab, lab packed in here. Instructions, Happy days. instructions <laughs> just weren't carried out. They just weren't carried out. And I think that's an issue, a general issue that needs to be addressed. Brian Whittle. Can I just firstly just reiterate what uh, Alec Neil just said, I think. If there's, an, if there's a, a, a directive sent out, or a moratorium sent out from, from the, 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 the health minister, I find, I find it surprising that, that, that there's no feedback to say whether a health board has upheld your directive. I think that's probably something we should, we should look at. I think, uh, just a very quick one, I think that given your consistent desire to have your uh, evidence removed from the final report, uh, and given there was a 10-month period where you weren't involved in any input within that report. In your opinion, does that then make the final report void? Yes. Definitely. Yes, because we don't agree with a large part of the content, and that is why we went to the Cabinet Secretary for help. But she didn't listen. Eleven days later, she published the report. She could. We asked her to wait and at least investigate our concerns. What harm would it have done to suspend publication for a month or two 
to investigate the concerns we had, to investigate the concerns Dr Agur had, to speak to the previous chair who had resigned for personal reasons or whatever reasons, I feel as though it was rushed. And we'd actually not like to know why it was rushed. What was the hurry? I think that's a consideration for us. Okay, I, I don't know if there are any final questions. Michelle, and then Neil, briefly, and then we'll need to come to a conclusion. Yeah, I, I just want to ask you about um, the tone, because you've talked a bit about things changing and then being excluded. When you started out on this journey as, as the independent inquiry, you were very much, from reading the papers, it looks like you were very much looking at what do we need to do going forward. And the interim report talks about the need to change um, processes, you know, looking at the benefits and, and detriments of mesh, etc. Did that conversation ever talk about looking backwards? I mean, you just said in the last couple of minutes, you know, how's it going to help us, those of you who have already had the procedure. So at what point, if, if at all, up to the interim report, did that conversation take place in the review group? Yeah, they did speak about, um, because we asked about retrospective studies going through health, every health board doing a study to find out how many patients have suffered, how many... Pa I mean, a lot of patients don't even know what device they have inside them. We have women in our group that have got three medical devices inside them. And, you know, it's not in their medical records. Records have been lost. So we asked for a <coughs> comprehensive study we were told that it would take far too long and too much money. And when you look at the cost of this review, I think, well, perhaps Neil will be able to correct me because he asked the parliamentary question, but I think it was 4,000 and something pounds was the cost of this entire review. And, you know, perhaps if more money had been spent and there had been a retrospective study, for all the women here that have been harmed and all the women that haven't yet came forward or all the women that have been told they've got sciatica, um, you know, or some other obscure disease, um, we might have been looking at a very different scenario. But when we're told at the start that safety is not the remit of the review and we had to ask quite strongly to get it in the title of the review, that actually said it all for us. Can I ask them bluntly, looking forward, in terms of the review body saying, OK, there's a problem with this, we shouldn't do this anymore. If they're being blunt and saying, there's a problem with this, should we have known that, and therefore is there any liability, was that discussed? Um, I, I think it's more about what was known then, <coughs> as opposed to what is known now. Mm -hmm. We've come a long way. You heard Dr Agur saying he was, you know, used mesh, all mesh, at one time. Then he lessened, lessened it and, you know, it was one particular procedure, but now he's not for it. So it's what is known now. So I don't think there should be... Gosh, I don't want myself into bother. I, I foot and mouth. Um, <laughs> I'm asking if there was any discussion in the review group. No. no. None at all? No. Thank you. Briefly. Just briefly, I want to confirm that um, when that request was made to Shona Robinson for not to put that, uh, uh, to include Elaine and Olive's submission, um, both Jackson and I, Jackson, Carlo and I were in the room when that request was made. And as far as I was concerned at that meeting, that was a, the inference was that that was a guarantee that was given. And that did not materialise. Times, <coughs> because the, the health minister actually said, you've already said that already yeah. to me. And I said, well, just make sure that you understand that's what we want. OK. I think we've come to a conclusion in terms of the questions we want to ask. And I thank you very much um, for responding so um, honestly and thoroughly and, and realise, appreciate both for you and for the people behind you that this is a very personal matter and therefore it takes a great deal more energy than to deal with something that's not so directly had a massive impact on your lives. Um, we have to now think about how we're going to take this forward. Um, I should say, I think, that a letter to the Cabinet Secretary down accessing the relevant information on the website can easily be done if the committees agreed to that. With simple, that can be done today because um, that is a, is, is a concern. I think there are broader issues around... <laughs> I 
how the health service treats people. I mean, one of the things that struck me in the report, between the interim report and the final report, that they removed the women were not believed to, the women felt they were not believed, which it, it feels like semantics, but it's actually a pretty substantial point. So there are broader issues, I think, that have come out about the way an independent review should be conducted, the role of patients, the balance of medical interests, which is, I think, something we would also want to consider. I think there's process issues that obviously we would want to explore with the Cabinet Secretary around what did she expect of the group, what were the limits of it and so on. I think these are all things. But on the really substantial issue of actually what happened in terms of this process and whether women are now any safer for the review having taken place, I think that's a massive question. I think we have been taken aback by the response from, I mean, literally across the world, it rather spooked me out when I read that somebody in New Zealand was keep, carefully watching our proceedings. Um, but th this is something that's, that's beyond Scotland. So I think we would be very keen, as a committee that, that we are, um, taking further action on this. That we, ha we have secured a debate in the, in the chamber on the question, where it allows more broadly the parliament and... Um, people watching to understand some, some of the very complex issues and some of the, frankly, quite straightforward issues. And it, it means that the minister will have to respond there. But I think in terms of us really thinking through what we want to do next stage, I think what would be useful would be to get a note from the clerk, which really brings together all the strands that are here, um, including, you know, oversight um, from the MHRA, um, I think, and that would allow us to come back in public session to really sort of report on what we think we need to be doing next, because I think all of us are very alive to the very strong interest and concern around these issues that you've, you and your campaigning group have been so effective in highlighting. But I don't know if anyone else has particular suggestions of things that we would want to be included in the, the, the Clark's notices in terms of taking action forward. Uh, Alec? Can, can I just mention two things, convene I'm not a member of the committee, so this is just a personal opinion, but I think the suggestion by <laughs> Dr Auger that they, even, even today, putting the final report out to a formal public consultation is one definitely worth considering. It seemed to me that that was quite a sensible suggestion and perhaps one way of getting the content eventually uh, changed. Uh, the second point is, as you know, I've suggested, and I know there's support from the campaigners, uh, and I know there is <coughs> other support around the table for the idea of a global conference. It, it, it might be a good idea to consider that the, this committee should actually host a global conference on this, because the committee has the advantage of being cross-party, representing the parliament rather than any one individual party or one individual group. Uh, and it's maybe something I think would be a first for the Parliament to do that. I mean, today, today we're hosting uh, the Scottish Business and Parliament Conference, so we do host conferences as a Parliament, and I think it would be a good idea to consider whether the committee should actually host a global conference. Uh, you would obviously need the appropriate uh, support and authorisation from the parliamentary authorities, but I think it would give a dimension to this that it deserves. Any other comments on? Sorry, Michelle, then Brian, then Rona. Sorry. Yeah. Could we write to the chair I, I'm, and just ask about minutes um, and minutes from all the meetings? I mean, as a, as a review group, all meetings should have been minuted. So I think it would be worth asking the chair. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming that would be part of the remit of the, um, the review of the review, mm. um, whether we're, we're going to work through... Can I suggest some of these technical things about who we can mm -hmm. speak to? But I think you're right mm -hmm. to, address, to raise the issue of, of minutes and record of meetings. Let's think about who best we should then mm -hmm. um, have that conversation I'm just concerned with. that the review group is not planning on reporting until the middle of next year. Um, yeah. And I'm hoping we're going to move a little bit quicker. Mm. OK, Brian? Um, I'm kind of struck as um, with there being perhaps being a cultural issue. Uh, and I don't know whether that's specifically for this uh, petition, but across a number of petitions and across uh, some other evidential th uh, evidence that, that probably most of have, I've had from constituents around this, a cultural issue of uh, protectionism, quite frankly, within 
uh, within uh, certain sectors of the NHS. And I wonder if that's something that should be considered within this committee on this issue or, um, or more broadly. I think if we're, if we're producing a, a report and having a debate, these are all legitimate issues to raise within that. It's, it's clearly specifically an issue to women. So is there an issue about women's health and the way in which people respond to that? I think the point you made earlier about the impact of a ministerial directive, naively, my assumption that if you say that something shouldn't happen, it wouldn't happen, and that there would be no such procedures while there was an investigation. I think it's something that would be worthwhile looking at, and I think this point about the retrospective study it's also an important one to understand properly what the, the impact was and explore that further. Can I just <coughs> pick up on something you said there, John, and that was about this affecting women. This is now affecting men too. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we are now begin, getting men coming through who have had hernia mesh implanted and also it's been affecting the partners or husbands yes, of women. So absolutely. we just need to be a wee yeah. bit careful. No, I appreciate <coughs> that. I think that point is well made because we do know that the even from my distance from it, it's clearly an impact on, on families and which just goes beyond just the individual patient themselves. Um, what power the petitions committee has got, but I think from today it's very, very clear that mesh procedures should stop until we have all the answers because we don't have them and it, it should stop right now and don't put any other patients at further risk. Mm -hmm. I mean, we will certainly be in, as part of our decisions around this, one of these will obviously be to have a conversation with the Cabinet Secretary. And of course, when this debate comes to the Parliament, while well, the committee members will bring their experience of the, the Petitions Committee, will there be a members vote? right will there across, be a vote at the end of that? There would normally debate? not be a vote no. on, 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 on the, the Public Petition Committee, would probably produce a report and it would be noted and all of these issues could be explored. That's not to stop these matters being then... ...on to the recommendations yes. within eight weeks. Yes. So the government would have to come forward. <coughs> it's absolutely compulsory for the government to come forward with its response to the committee's recommendations. Yeah. Very briefly. Convener, yeah. I, I, I don't want to attempt to direct the committee, God forbid, but <laughs> if this committee was to make the recommendation that, given the evidence that has heard, that there should be a suspension, that suspension could continue, I think that would be very powerful. <coughs> that is something, certainly, but we, I think we have to, without um, misrepresent the power of this group and its capacity to make those decisions, we can reflect those views in our report, I think, and ask the Scottish Government to um, reflect on them, but it certainly wouldn't be the matter for this uh, committee to make those clinical judgments, but I think we have afforded the opportunity for those arguments to be presented in public, and I think that is, has been very useful. Can I just say, in conclusion, clearly there's a great deal more to be done this. Can I thank um, our visitor MSPs for being here? Can I thank our, our witnesses and those in the gallery for their attendance too, and really just to reiterate there's a whole series of issues here that we recognise are of, of great importance, and we one assurance I can give you, I think, from the committee that we take our responsibilities in this regard very seriously and we'll obviously reflect on the evidence session and we'll come back at public session to report on what further action we want to take. And with that, can I uh, close this meeting? <laughs>